Are you ready? everyone welcome to the range report i'm really excited about tonight's content we're going to announce a sponsorship very very shortly short interview coming up on the show but also i had the pleasure of sitting down with patty dench australia's first ever medalist in shooting at olympic games she won a bronze in la in 1984 what a fantastic lady she is she won the medal at 52 and now at 88 is still as sharp as a tack and very feisty and very competitive and I really want a big shout out to Pat Zeppieri and the New South Wales Amateur Pistol Association, the President Brian Cheers. They put us in contact with Paddy Dench and they've got a story coming up in their magazine in a couple of weeks and they've kindly allowed us to run our story on air here tonight. So sit back and enjoy one of the great Olympians, Paddy Dench. So, Paddy, can we go right back to the early days of when you started pistol shooting? How did you get involved? Well, it was really just by accident. I uh, met this guy who was a shooter, used to sit outside the range, read a book. And they said, oh, come and have a shot, Paddy. I said, oh, no. I said, I can't look down the sides of a rifle. I'd be hopeless. Oh, we'll fix you. So they put a browning in my hand, put patches over my left eye on my glasses, now this is where you aim underneath the white and squeeze the trigger. And so I got all the shots on the target, and most of them in the black. Oh, I said, this is good. I like this. And that's how it all started. You were a natural from the very first time you picked up a firearm. Yeah, I ended up, I bought myself a secondhand Hemley and I started off in uh, B grade. And uh, so uh, that was in uh, 74. So we decided to go to the uh, nationals in Tasmania in 75. And so I'd got up to B grade and then I was going to down there. So I used to go shoot, you know, every weekend and uh, pick up my gun every day, train. I was so excited going to the nationals. I was so thrilled and went down there and came 10th in Australia. In your first nationals. Did you have a coach in the early days or yes, did that come yeah. later on? Uh, John Davidson taught me how to shoot. He was, um, he was the guy who taught me and coached me and, um, um, and was my mentor in my shooting. So 75 First Nationals, uh, how long till you made an Australian team? Uh, 78, I went to the World Championships in Korea. and. Uh, I went to the Nationals in um, 76 in Adelaide and came second. You talk about 78 in Seoul. You picked up a silver medal there at a World Championship. I know. Uh, our teams came second in air pistol and sport pistol. And then I went back in 79 to shoot in the first World Air Weapons and I came second in the World Air Weapons. And you pick up the silver medal, I think. In, uh, came second, seven. Yeah, I came second. You may also be the only Australian to pick up a medal at a world championship. Yeah. Pretty special. Oh, I'm not sure, yeah. Well, um, well world championships. Because then I went to East Germany. They had the world championships there. And I came, I got a medal there from East Germany. How long into the journey as a pistol shooter did you see the Olympics as a, as a possible goal and something that you could achieve? Well, uh, well I didn't realise, but uh, John said to me, he said, you know, the, the ladies are going to shoot in 1984. Oh, I said, are they? So on my first pistol, Barry Cameron had shaped the grip on my gun. So each, each I bought um, the next gun. I would just put that grip on that gun. And then in, when I was going to go uh, work to go to the Olympics in 1984, I decided to buy myself a new pistol. So I just took the grip off, put my old grip on, 
and it just felt natural, you know, felt great in my hand. And then um, the first time I shot it, went over to Blacktown and shot with Ray Gray and I duelled with him and I duelled 299, first time I fired it. So it was, it was meant for you and it fitted yeah. perfectly. It was a beautiful gun, loved it, yeah. And I think it's an important point to to make that 84 was the first time there was female shooting at the Olympic Games. So you were a bit of a pioneer in that respect. Yes, well, um, I, I just loved shooting and uh, I, we were going to all the competitions in Sydney. Um, around each month there was a shoot somewhere. I'd always go to that, go away to... Um, we used to go up to Orange to shoot and um, I just... Just love shooting, and I just I just shot the scores and got into the squad, and so that's how it all just started. Who would you put down as your greatest influence on your career to get you to that Olympic level? Well, the only person that taught me anything was John. When I when I was going to the the Olympics, I said to John, I used to go over there and train, and he'd be there with me, and I'd say bought myself a recorder. I said, I want your voice on this recorder. I said, when I go over there, I've got nobody. I'm going over there, I've got nobody with me and I want about to hear somebody that I know. And he said, I can't teach you anything. You know, you know what you're doing. I said, that doesn't matter. I just want to hear your voice. And so he was just my mentor that just went right through with me because I had no one else to train me. What was it like in the Australian teams in those early days going overseas? As you said, you didn't have coaches travel with you, just a couple of athletes and off you went? Uh, I can't. Well, um, oh, well, when you went to World Titles, Tibor went along. Tibor, um, that was the head coach, he, he came along. And, but then, I don't know whether I should say this, I'm a, I'm a woman, you see. So the thing is that, uh, it's always very difficult being a woman in a, the team. They, um, you always feel that the men are prioritised, you know. But uh, that didn't worry me. I just, I just got up there and shot the best of my abilities. And quite often that was better than the men anyway. <laughs> it could be, yeah. yeah. Well, I went away. I went away on every trip. When I started to shoot for Australia, I was in the team every time. Were they funded trips or did you have to uh, shell out my, of your own if I shot the If I shot the scores, if I shot the scores, it was free. If I didn't shoot the scores, I may have to pay for my accommodation or, or what airfare or whatever. So you had to train, you had to shoot the best you can, but it doesn't always happen, does it? I mean, you have an off day. You don't shoot as well some days as, as others. You were regarded in your career as being mentally very tough. Where do you think that comes from? Tough. To be able to handle the pressure, to be able to absorb what's going on around you and just focus and do your job. Uh, I think that I'm lucky that I've got it. Um, I've been, um, I've worked all my life. I was a machine operator in an office. Uh, I had work to do and I would just sit there and do it. And I could shut off everything else and just, just sit there and just do my work. I was a, in all my training, I was always top of my class in, when I was learning machines. And, um, and figures, were, numbers were my, were, were my, um, was my job. I wasn't a, a, a typist, I was a figure person. And having four children as well while you're going through this journey, that must have been quite hard to balance family life and training and getting to the top of the game? Well, no, I was lucky. The children were old enough to be doing their own thing in life. And so the demands on me weren't as great as young children. I was lucky. I know that it was difficult. I used to see uh, young women with young children at the range and they, the children be coming up and their mum's trying to shoot and they say, oh, mummy, 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 can I have some money? You know, I never had that trouble. So I, I then became, this is when I became selfish, I dare say, was the start. You've got to be selfish to a certain degree. And, uh, and so I just, went sh I just went shooting. And the kids came along, obviously some of them shoot as well? Or have well, they? when I went to the first, world, um, first nationals down in Tasmania, I took Christopher and Stuart. They were my youngest twins. And uh, 
uh, and we had a great time down there. And then uh, my eldest boy, Mark, he took up shooting, so I used to, we used to go out to the range together, so that was great. And, uh, and now my, one of my youngest twins, he now shoots, he shoots um, lever action rifle. Yeah, you've got two sets of twins. That's yes. uh, quite unusual. Yeah, yeah. I wish for three sons and a daughter, and that's what I got. Ah, that's a good thing. So the process of qualifying to go to the Olympics in 1984, what was it like in Australia back then? How did, how did you qualify? Did it have well, you had to go away and shoot in competition, you know, like maybe go to the shoot up in Newcastle uh, or the Orange. Had to, you had to go to competitions. Uh, they had the CMPC shoots, and you had to submit your scores of what you were shooting. And then you had to go down to a camp. Sometimes we had them up in Queensland, uh, but they, know, they may not have been for the Olympics, but we went to Canberra to uh, the range down there, and we'd have to shoot scores down there, and that's when you qualified. And, and then you get a letter, on, I'm assuming, from the Australian Olympic Committee to say that you're selected in the team? Yeah, I think it was a letter. I don't know whether it was a letter or a phone call. So I got that sort of in the March, because we went over there in the March before. So that was, great. That was exciting to be selected, yeah. Yeah, very proud moment to get selected. And obviously you want to go there and do your absolute best. Oh, yeah, that's when the hard work started. That, then I had to work harder than what I was doing just to shoot. When I, when I was selected, I then, I was still, I was walking 15 kilometres a week. I was going to the gym at least three times a week for muscle toning. And, I, and then to, when I went to go to the Olympics, I just shot four and five times a week. I, I think went you're ahead work. of the game. Uh, some of the athletes today don't understand the work away from the range that they need to do, and that was obviously part of your preparation. Oh, yes. Uh, I, when, when I was shooting, I used to even go to the chiropractor to look after my elbow, and uh, he'd give me um, like a treatment on my elbow and, uh, and just look after me because, you know, I had beautiful muscles in this arm because the gun weighed two pound or one kilo, so you had to have... Strong legs and a strong arm, and I had both. 84 Olympics, uh, reasonably successful from the Australian point of view. Four gold, eight silver, 12 bronze. Do you remember mixing with those athletes and, and some of the names that you went away with in 84? It's really strange, you know, you go, to the, you go to the Olympics. When you go down there to have breakfast in the canteen, everyone sat in their little groups. They sat in their little groups. They sat in their little groups because they were the people that they knew. And I was the only lady pistol shooter, and I went with Sylvia, who was the rifle shooter. And so she was shooting different times than me, so we hardly crossed paths unless we went to bed, because we were in the same room. So you, you're really wandering around on your own. You know, people don't, they don't really mix. Well, they didn't mix with me, because I, I was 52 when I went to the Olympics. So all these other athletes over there are young. They were young people. I was. I would have been old to them. I think I would have been one of the oldest people in the in the team, at 52. Yeah, you were in in the Olympic final. You're about around 10 to 12 years older than the gold and silver medalists, and uh, 20 odd years older than the rest of the field. So, uh, do you think people maybe looked at you and went, "Is she an athlete?" Yeah, that's right. You see, yeah. But you see, people don't realise shooting is a wonderful uh, sport to get into. I mean, I've got one leg shorter than the other from a car accident. I used to be a golfer. I just won the gold medal at golf, and I was going to play golf all my life. And, and then I couldn't walk the course. And so people with these kind of uh, disabilities, you can still stand and shoot. Get yourself fit and put your mind to it. It's a great sport. Take me through the Olympic competition. How were you leading into the, into the qualifying, nerves, uh, anticipation, excitement? Well, the thing is, you know, I'd had so much international experience that I felt quite comfortable on the range. And I was very fit. And being fit just stood me in great stead. I reckon that was the, the best thing that I could have done to get myself as fit as I was. And... Um, I, the only time that my heart thumped 
with my last five shots on duelling. I was, I shot 49, 49, I shot 50, 50, 50. And the last five shots, I never thought I could keep my arms straight to come up on the target. But with all the training that I'd done, I had good trigger control. I, I shot by my breathing and I was the only time I took my earmuffs off. And the guy behind me, big American, he says, you got him, Paddy. I looked in my scope and I had another 50. Now that, I got that because I had trained and trained and trained and I was fit. You actually shot off for the bronze medal. Yep. So there was a fair bit of pressure on that one and, and the competitor, I think was about 30 years old. Yeah, she, oh, she, was a, she was in the army. She was a young Chinese girl. She looked about 18, I think. But anyway, I beat her. <laughs> so that was the main thing. Yeah, it was a Chinese shooter, uh, Lu Hai Ying. She was 32 years of age. Oh, was well, she 32? And you, and you beat her, so, it, yeah. I was 52, so, yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> well, I, I'd, I'd had quite a few shoot-offs and I'd won the whole lot of them. So it, it was, it, it uh, see, I'd, the experience stood me in great stead. The experience that I'd had before I went to the Olympics got me through. And you're ready to go. The gold medal went to Linda Thom from Canada. Uh, did you know her? You would have known her from the world circuit? Yeah, I'd seen her and Ruby Fox came second. I was shooting with Ruby Fox down in Fort Worth because we went there for three weeks before we went to the Olympics and it was just Ruby and I on this whopping big shooting range down at the army base. What do you remember about the younger athletes? Because I said you had around 30 to 32 years age on, on some of them. Uh, uh, Liu Hyang came fourth. Uh, she was from China. There was a uh, girl from Norway, uh, Christina Fries. Did, did you know many of those athletes, or they were just on the line with you? And yeah, yeah, I knew, I knew, uh, I knew, uh, I knew a couple from Scandinavian countries. I just can't remember their names. Just acquaintances. Just acquaintances. Yeah. So you came back to Australia, as you said, you were Athlete of the Year, um, obviously a lot of accolades, winning the first ever shooting medal for Australia. It's pretty special seeing that uh, shooting's been in the Olympics since the early, since the first modern Olympics. Mm. Well, everybody wanted to talk to me, which was great. And I did a lot of PR work and we got a lot of new shooters. Uh, and and I, had, I, I was sort of never done that sort of thing, but it was easy to do because I was talking about something that I loved and I could just talk about it. So I was quite comfortable. I used to go to quite a few schools, Lions clubs, Rotary clubs. So, uh, and everybody enjoyed it. And because everybody wanted to see the medal. Which is around your neck now, and we'll get some close-ups of that uh, a little bit later. But uh, obviously pride and joy of your sporting career. The, the medal is the, is the, is the uh, pinnacle and the pride uh, and joy of your sporting yeah, career. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when I went there, because the, they want to interview you, how, you, how, you, how do you reckon you're going to go, Paddy? I said, oh, I think I could come in the top five. Uh, I said, I, uh, I was shooting really well. And uh, when I came home from the Olympics, I went down to a shoot down in Shell Harbour and shot 294 precision and 297 dueling. I shot 591. That's, that's very good. You shot uh, 583 to get the bronze in Los Angeles and 585 was an Olympic record. So you, you, you bettered that when you came back. Yeah. I was, I, I, if, yeah. It was a bit disappointing. It was um, a bit of an upset at the beginning of the match. So I think it, it threw me, put me off. I had I'd worked out everything that I was going to do and uh, and I was going by the second relay from March that they started at 11. And when I walked in the range at half past 10, they said, shoot us to the line. Ah, oh, this is at the Olympics. They, they brought it forward. So you had a little bit and of... And I a, didn't know, and all I had on the piece of paper was second relay. And so when I walked in the side door, everybody's there. Every, and I'd been there since half past nine. And so I just went over and put my things on the table, uh, but it threw me. I had worked out down to a T exactly what I was going to do. And so I lost 11 points in the first 15 shots. I was so cranky with myself. 
So I gave myself a really severe talking to, you can shoot better than this, Paddy. I lost four in the next 15, and that's how I was shooting. I was shooting 290 plus in precision on training at the Olympics. And then to shoot 285 was very disappointing. But anyway, I came back, shot 298. And when I shot that 298, I wandered down the range. I just left my gear there, and I saw Ruby. I said, oh, how'd you go, Ruby? Oh, she said, not too bad. I said, oh, I just shot my best duelling ever. Oh, did you? What'd you shoot, Paddy? I said, oh, 298. Oh, swapped you, she says. I said, well, what's the best score? Oh, she said, 585. And I shot 583. She said, Linda's shot 585. I've shot 585. I said, I've shot 583. And so the whole lot of us had to shoot off for first, second and third. Yeah, tough competition at the Olympics. Uh, the step back up and... and Obviously, the Chinese shooter couldn't match you for skill and precision. Well, I think it was, I'm sure it was all the matches that I'd gone to and, and I'd been shooting uh, for uh, 10 years. That stood me in great stead, yeah. And, and, I, and I, I wasn't nervous. I was, I was relaxed to a certain degree because I was very fit I knew, knew people on the range. It was just, it just was like going to a shoot. You, know, you couldn't think about that you were at the Olympics. You were just going to a shoot. That's what you've got to mentally think, you know. You can't put too much pressure on yourself. You don't go there to shoot scores. You go there to shoot groups. And that's what I, or my philosophy was all the time, shoot a good group. I think we'll be putting some of this into a coaching manual. This is fantastic. It's, it's all the things that, that shooters, get, they get ahead of themselves and they think, I've got to shoot this score, I've got to get the next one. No, can't do that, no. You've got to, you've got to, rush, you've got to really be very um, regimented, strong, know exactly what you're going to do and get all the right thoughts in your head. I mean, my last thought every night when I went to sleep was a sight picture. Yeah, yeah that's a nice sight picture, yeah. used to think about it all the time. I used to go over, drive over to the range from work and when I got over there I couldn't remember, I couldn't remember the drive. The whole time I was thinking about shooting and I thought, oh my God, Father, so I hope I didn't do anything wrong. A couple of red lights on the way through. <laughs> it was frightening, yeah. And sometimes I'd go over to the range and I couldn't concentrate. And so when I, I never practised bad shooting. If I couldn't concentrate and shoot well, I would just pack up. If I shot 10 shots and after 20 shots I couldn't shoot properly, I would just pack up and go. And I believe do not keep training if you can't concentrate and shoot your good shots. Yeah, probably a word of advice there about shooting quality, maybe not quantity. Yeah, quality is that's what it's all about, quality. And then it gets down to groups all the time. This is these are the thoughts that you've got to have. You very much, again, ahead of your time, you had a match plan. You knew, as you said, you went to the Olympics, you had everything set out in your mind and the plan on what you were going to do. It threw you a little bit, obviously, the timings, but you had a match plan, so you could come back to that. Oh, yes, yeah. Well, see, when we, were in, uh, we went down to Fort Worth, we were down there, and all I'm shooting on this w huge range with Ruby Fox, there's two of us. I went to the, ma I went to, the manager was there and the coach, and I said, I don't want to be here. I'd, I'd never really ever done this in my life. I said, I don't want to be here. I said, I want to be up in L.A. So they just packed me up and I got in the plane and I flew myself, I flew myself up to L.A. You want to be training in the environment? That yeah, I didn't want to be in Fort Worth. There was no atmosphere. I'm in, I'm in this uh, army base. It was dreadful. So I just went up there. They stayed there and I went up to L.A. Trained up there. Did you get to march in the opening or closing ceremonies? No. Nope. Too, too close to competition? Well, I shot the first day, so they wouldn't let me. Oh, fair enough, because i that was the only time I cried. They all had their uniforms on. I never ever wore my uniform, my walking out uniform. And I saw, waved them goodbye on the bus, and I had a tear in my eye. And um, then I saw them coming home about 10 o'clock at night. And that's why I, I was pleased I didn't go. Yeah, that fatigue side of it, oh, that yeah. uh, Terrible lot of mental time. energy for an opening ceremony, that you, you need that focus for the competition. Yeah. I, no, they, they did the right thing. And then I was there, they let me stay there for a little while because I'd won a medal. 
and then I was sent home. So I never went to the closing ceremony either. So you didn't stay till the end of the games? Nope. Okay, that's interesting. I think it's changed a little bit these days where the athletes will stay right till the end. If you compete on day one, you, you have the rest of the time to absorb the games and to go and watch other sports. So you I did, oh yeah, I, yeah, I got some tickets to go and see the velodrome. I went to the bike racing. Uh, I never went, and I, um, yeah, I never went, I never went very far, I never did much. Walked around the range, signed autographs, you know, talked to people. You were 52 when you won your bronze medal. Do you kind of look back and think, oh, I would have liked to have got into shooter, shooting when I was much younger and maybe had more? I mean, did you retire after 84 when you came back? No, I retired in 88. Um, I never went to another Olympics, but I went to World Cups after that. After the Olympics, we went to uh, Munich and I came second to Russia. But I went to interesting places to shoot. So we went to East Germany. We went to Seoul. And that was when the wall was still up. It was really quite interesting going to East Germany to shoot because we were in Munich and then we drove over the, uh, into East Germany and because in Munich there's beautiful Mercedes cars, flower boxes, and then you go into East Germany. It was so drab and sad place it was. But, uh, well, they, they held the World Championships and, of course, they thought it was wonderful because the... Um, government there put things in the shops that all these people never ever had. You could you could no idea, it was just wonderful. And how close then to selection for 88 Olympics did you get or, or did no, you, they didn't you, you, try. you retired before then? No, I didn't try. No, it, it, um, I think in a, in a way um, my family suffered in a way because of, of what I achieved. They were, I know they were proud of me but the thing was you don't, you, you got these blinkers on and you're not thinking about anybody else it's, it's, a, it's a strange I can, when I look back I can't understand how it all happened but it just it just happened you know now I, I, I still don't know how it just all developed I just got this thought I, I just love shooting and so I did it yeah. I retired while I was still a master grade shooter and I didn't want to be down in a lower grade because I trained, I still kept shooting, I still trained, I still stayed up on top up to 88 and I had no life at all bar shooting and I said I've had enough, I'm just retired. Well it was a wonderful journey and uh, we really appreciate you taking us on it and, and reliving it for us. Well I hope you learned something from it and, and it's my uh, pleasure to do it for you and hope it encourages somebody else to have a dream. So you have a dream and you have to work at it. It's the only way you'll get there. Well, fantastic to have John Sammartino from Black Widow Projectiles on the range report tonight. And he's just announcing a new sponsorship. Welcome, John. Thanks, Mike. It's great for Black Widow to be involved in this. More than happy to come on board. Well, great to have a chat there with John Sammartino. Of course, uh, we now welcome Noel Harrod onto the show. And Noel, welcome. John Sammartino came on board to sponsor the Corona Quiz. Uh, Paddy Dench, what an inspiring story. And of course, we're going to do a feature on Black Widow projectiles coming up in a couple of weeks. Uh, what a fantastic show. Um, firstly, thank you so much to John. Fantastic to have one of our suppliers on as a sponsor and to make the quiz very worthwhile for the people who win. It's going you know, to add a bit of extra spice to the, uh, the competition, I think. And having Patty on is just sensational. What a great woman, what a great athlete, a real legend, and also a, a very much a trailblazer. Um, in those days, uh, the athletes didn't get support like they do now. So she had to do it all by herself, and uh, uh, very, very proud um, that she's a people shooter. I tell you, the competitive fire is still burning in the eyes of Patty Dench. Yeah, you get the feeling she could go to Tokyo and um, she'd give it a good shake, I think. <laughs> I really do. She would, she, she would indeed. <laughs> now, obviously around the country, corona restrictions are starting to be relaxed a little bit. People are getting back on the range. Uh, we've got a recruitment video coming up also, uh, which should be released in just a couple of weeks' time. Well, actually, it'll be released uh, hopefully early next week. Um, we've, we've seen the trial version. We've uh, we had a little bit of cuts one, two, and three. 
feedback's come in from the states and territories who are really ready to go into production now. Yeah, it's going to be a great, a great uh, video and a great release for pistol shooting. Yeah, it's a welcome back to the range and it's also an opportunity to invite people to come and try pistol shooting. It's such a great, fun, family-friendly activity and uh, we hope people jump on board and, and become part of it. What else is news on the front at Pistol Australia? Um, yeah, so things have been fairly busy. Um, the Chris shows um, moving into the final round soon, which will be very, very exciting to see what, uh, who's going to be the best state there and who's going to win the prize. We have quite a few uh, webinars still to do internationally. We're working on IWSF one at the moment with some uh, coaches from Europe and uh, from America. We'll have announcements on that very soon. And of course, the range report uh, will continue over the next uh, couple of months. We have an e-bulletin that goes out now every month and the next one will be available next week on our website and through all our channels. And I'd encourage everybody to try and follow us on social media and share and like where they can. Help us spread the news about pistol shooting and what a great sport it is. So Noel, with the relaxation of restrictions, we spent a week on the road capturing a bunch of content. We've got some really good interviews coming up with some of our stars of the sport and we'll be dropping those on the range report in the coming months. Yeah, that was a very busy week. Um, for those not in New South Wales, the restrictions were listed on the, lifted on the 1st of June and uh, we we're on the road at 8am that morning. And we were in uh, Orange, Newcastle, Central Coast, Sydney, Campbelltown, Canberra, Albury, Wodonga, everywhere we could go to get film, we went um, to make sure, just in case, we hope it doesn't happen, but just in case the restrictions come back. Yeah, it was a fun week. Uh, get, nice to be out and about, actually, and, and obviously practicing our social distancing. And I, I urge everybody as they get back to the range to follow your local guidelines, sanitize when you ar arrive at the range, keep your social distancing, go and enjoy yourself uh, where your ranges are open. Some states not quite yet. Uh, but it will come very, very soon. Yeah, it's very important that uh, everybody follows what their club presidents and their club's rules are in place, um, what the local police registry and especially their state and territory. Speak to them, make sure you stay safe, follow the rules. We don't want any incidents. It's very important that we follow the rules so we can keep shooting. So who's coming up next week on the quiz show? So next week, it's uh, uh, very traditional rivals, actually. Um, arch enemies in many, many ways in a lot of other sports. The big V from Victoria and the uh, South Australians from South Australia. It's going to be very, very interesting. Well, thanks for joining us, Noel. Thanks for the update. Folks, again, if you like what we're doing, please like and share on social media. Keep safe, keep well, get back to the range, have some fun. I'm Mike Westhorpe on behalf of the team signing off. See you next time.